Hello and welcome to Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast, where I'll be hanging out with players and teachers and having conversations loosely based around harmonica. You probably know this week's guest as the author of the best-selling instructional books Harmonica for Dummies and Blues Harmonica for Dummies, but there's so much more to the story than that. He's comfortable playing diatonic and chromatic across a wide variety of genres, including blues, jazz, and French, Canadian, Scottish folk. He's been described by Jason Ritchie as a mad scientist of harmonicas and harmonica music. He is none other than Winslow Yerksa. Welcome to the podcast, Winslow. How are you doing? Fine, thanks, and thank you for having me, Tomlin. Oh, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, so uh, where, whereabouts are you based? I'm based in San Francisco, California. Nice. And uh, you, you were saying before we, we started recording that uh, you've been able to enjoy a little bit uh, of, uh, of actual social uh, time in the middle of uh, COVID. How, how's that been? Well, it's been fine. I mean, people here mask up. They do all the, the, the proper things. And we're not that hard hit. Of course, California, having a large population, has large numbers, but the rates are relatively low. And, um, you know, I've been able to live my life. I go to the grocery store early in the morning so I don't have to line up. Um, can't play gigs. That's the, probably the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. All of my teaching has moved online, and that works fine. Um, those are the major things, really. Yeah. Yeah, um, the, the the no gigging thing has been uh, been difficult, I think, for for everyone. Are you finding that you're getting that that kind of slightly weird itch of I've not been on stage in a while and I need to go and express myself? Well, it would be nice. I was actually just getting back into gigging when this all came down, and you know, I was getting offers. Oh, come and play on my, you know, we'd like to book you. All that stuff, and then boom, it all just stops just as I was ramping back up. So. Uh, hopefully in not too distant future that will uh, will ha- start to happen again. Yeah, no, I I, I hope it hope it will, and uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that there'll still be the the desire to to see see people playing live. I know that uh, a lot of my students uh, are getting that kind of um, sort of hitting a brick wall because they've been practicing for a while and they're not seeing the improvement. And normally, what I would suggest to kind of get you out of that um, that sensation of of not being sure why you're even practicing is go to a gig and watch someone play and get inspired. And, and I can't say that at the moment. So I'm <laughs> hoping that we get to do that soon. Yeah. Yeah. It's not um, the same playing for a camera in a, in a virtual concert. No, it's really not. And I think, I mean, it's, it's one thing if you're playing uh, by yourself, if, if you can play at least with another musician in the same room as you, that, or automatically is, is a million times more pleasant and you get that interaction and someone listening yes. to you in real time. And yeah, I miss that at that as well. Um, so have you found that, that lockdown has been a, an opportunity to work on new things? Well, to some extent it has. Yes. Um, it seems like I'm always busy anyway, right now we're just doing some final, uh, touches on, um, repackaging. It's not really new editions of the dummies books. They're, just refreshing the look of them, but at the same time, uh, you know, refreshing web links to get rid of websites that might have gone away or, or new things that should be included. So it's it's kind of a minor dust off, but it still tends to require more work than one might think. Um, <clears throat> and refreshing the covers and making sure that the right things are said on the cover, all of that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I can imagine that, that maybe working with quite a, a big publisher the, the, the time timelines must be quite extended and it must be a while to kind of get things moving. Is that, is that right? Well, it has been slowed some. Now that particular publisher tends to work on very tight schedules. Okay. You know, it's not like you get a book advance and then you go sit on the beach in Mexico for six months and, and write <laughs> your, your magnum opus. It's like they say, okay, you have to deliver a quarter of the page count this month, another quarter next month. So it's a four months process to write a 300 plus page book. Wow. So it's it's a production line. Yeah, that's a big and chunk. It's pretty in- intensive. And now this isn't what's going on here, but still they're they're pushing me for uh, stuff so that they can get it into the the September mix. Basically, the fall book release um, uh, period is very important because then that goes into Christmas sales. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and that's what we're aiming towards. Very cool. And and uh, I mean the your your books. Uh, uh, among the, I think I read that they're in the, the top five of the best-selling dummies books overall, uh, which I thought was was awesome that Harmonica is up there. 
I think well, they were early on. I'm not sure where they are now. Uh, and of course, there are always newer, cheaper harmonica books coming out as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and people do buy on price, unfortunately. Um, so I'd, I'd actually thought of coming up with something much shorter and maybe self-publishing um, you know, to compete on price. And then I thought, do I really want to go to that effort? Especially because the book business, I mean, people aren't buying books like they once did. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one because I, I I have those thoughts uh, every once in a while of you know why well why aren't I self publishing but why aren't other people self publishing because there, there's virtually zero barrier to entry to putting a book out there uh, but yeah as you say are, are people actually you know buying books like they used yeah. to well a physical book means physical objects you know it means uh, inventory. It means shipping, you know, it means all of those things, which are rather inconvenient. Um, you could put a book in PDF format or Kindle. Kindle has a lot of limitations. Um, but then there's the problem of duplicability. Mm -hmm. Because once something's in a, in, a, in a downloadable form, it's also very easily pirated. Absolutely. Yeah, so there's that, there's that as well. Yeah. I guess, uh, you know, you're... you're, you're as you said, you're a, you're a very busy person, and I was looking at kind of uh, things that you, you work on in general and, and how they've uh, transitioned a little bit in recent times. And uh, you, you run the uh, Harmonica Collective with uh, Jason Ritchie, don't you? Yes, and we've got our producer Tom Watson as well. Very cool. Uh, but you've yeah. you've moved that on to uh, online uh, workshops, haven't you? Well, we've had to. Yeah. Uh, we were going to do one in March, but then COVID came down and we, we couldn't do that. And it's it's a blast to do that. Again, it's like live music. Mm -hmm. It's really wonderful to interact directly with people, you know, with our colleagues, with other musicians, you know, with the students. Um, so what we're doing now is we're interviewing um, basically the, the cream of harmonica players and people in related fields. Uh, we've done Charlie Musselwhite. That one went, went really well last month. Uh, Magic Dick, uh, Mark Hummel. And uh, we're working on, I can't announce yet because we, we, we haven't got it confirmed yet, but we're, we're looking at um, working with someone who's not only a great player, but a great customizer. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Um, so it sounds like you may be doing them more regularly than you would be uh, doing the, the kind of live in-person events. Well, we're doing them every, uh, every month, first Sunday of each month. And again, because it's all online, there, there isn't the logistical uh, stuff. Mm -hmm that would go into pr producing a live event, which we've only ever done really once a year. We were thinking of doing it twice a year, and that might come up in the future, depending on, of course, pandemic situation. Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all, all about that, isn't it? Um, right do, now. Is there a way, uh, are the students able to, to kind of get the interaction that they would uh, in an in-person event with the online ones? Yes. I mean, it's at times a bit awkward, partly because of latency. Sometimes people's microphones tend to uh, cut off a note that's sustained after a certain amount of time. They've got some kind of a noise gate uh -huh. um, that may be in the computer itself or it may be actually in, in the app like Skype, because all of these things are based on the idea that speech is the main medium. Mm -hmm. So when you have a sustained tone, I mean, nobody speaks in long, long vowels. <laughs> uh, so those, those don't seem to be part of the of, of the setup. So there are little inconveniences like that, but mostly it works fine. I mean, you can't see the entire person necessarily. You can't see what they're doing with their abdomen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, I mean, you you can, but you have to kind of move around relative to the camera. You know, most people are in this sort of tight um, uh, shoulders up sort of um, uh, visible format, mm -hmm. and we need to see more than that, of course, to teach a breathing based instrument. But again, these are just things that are easy to work around. Yeah. And also, I think that, you know, it's still very early days of, of getting people online. Um, like I was chatting to Joe Felisco uh, for, for the podcast uh, last month. And, you know, he, he was kind of saying that he'd never done Instagram Live. He'd never done Zoom. He'd never done Skype. And then he'd done all three in, in the same day. And it was kind of just a huge revelation. So I think... As, as we go further on, people are going to get slicker and slicker at doing it and people will probably get better at filming themselves and it'll get kind of more of an immersive experience. 
Well, we're kind of being pushed into it by circumstances, and I think that's going to leave its mark. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Before it was like, oh yeah, that exists. Do I really want to get involved? Uh, right. <laughs> you know, I, I'd rather do what I know. You know. But now we're being forced to know new things and try new paths, and I, I think it'll be a positive result overall. Yeah, I think it's uh, it, it's kind of the the introverts uh, kind of ultimate setup because I I think. I've had a lot of students in the past say that they don't want to come to in-person events because they find it quite scary. And, and I mm. totally get that. I find, you know, if I go as, as a customer or a student to one of those kind of things, it is quite scary. And the idea that you can do it from the comfort of your own home uh, must be quite liberating if, if you're feeling quite introverted. Yeah. Well, another thing that we're doing, um, we this is a different we, uh, SPA, the Society for the Preservation and Advancement of the Harmonica. Again, we have an annual five-day convention in July, and pardon me, in, in uh, early August, and uh, usually with about 500 people in attendance. And of course, again, we've had to take that online. So now we've got SPA week, and we're still going to have entertainers giving concerts. We're still going to have uh, seminar presenters. We're still going to do our award ceremony. We obviously won't be able to serve dinner at the Saturday night mm -hmm. banquet, but we're finding ways to do all of this stuff. And I think it will draw potentially a much wider audience because people don't have to travel and pay for a hotel and so forth. You know, what we'll miss of, again, though, is that, you know, you stumble out of your hotel room at four in the morning and somebody's doing something really cool, <laughs> which actually does happen quite a lot. Oh, yeah. I've seen so many videos of com completely ridiculous setups of, you know, like, here's Jason Ritchie hanging out with Will Wilde, and they're having this crazy jam, at, as you say, four in the morning. And it's, uh, yeah, it's very cool. I'd actually been planning on coming to Spa this year. Um, and ah. <laughs> obviously, it's it's not going to happen this year. But I, I'm hoping that um, next year, we'll be able to uh, get over there. And um, well, I'm hoping that, that people can travel full stop. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm hoping that too. And I certainly look forward to seeing you there. Should we all be able to be in attendance? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, let's move away from kind of current, current times and, and, uh, uh, and the Harmonica Collective and Spa, which I, I've actually, I've, I've made notes of in the show notes below. So I encourage people go in and check them out. Uh, and I'm really excited that you, you're moving Spa online. That's that's a really big deal and actually something I was going to ask you about. So that's that's good. You've already answered that question. Um, but yeah, let's let's go, go back a little bit to uh, how you got started uh, playing Harmonica. Well, I was so 14 going on 15 years old and singing in a garage band. And um, I didn't play an instrument at that point. And I had built an electric kazoo. Uh, well, my mother had worked as a young woman as, as, as a uh, telephone operator, and she still had these headphones, which were high impedance. And the, uh, instead of a speaker cone, it had a metal disc, which was screwed down by the earpiece. And if you loosened it, the disc would rattle, and because it was high impedance, you could use it as a microphone, and that would create the buzz that the uh, membrane on a kazoo would do. So I used to hum harmonica parts into this electric kazoo. And after a while, I started feeling silly, and I thought, gee, maybe I should just get a harmonica. And mostly what I was hearing was blues-based harmonica from British blues rock bands like Cream, Rolling Stones, you know, people like that. And just dribs and drabs of it here and there. Um, and so at school, I asked a fellow who played, oh, what should I get? And he said, oh, get a C harp. I didn't tell him that I was trying to play a tune in the key of E, which was Cream's version of Spoonful. But the harmonica solo was just the notes E and G, which you can play on, you know, just in whole two of a C harmonica. So I did that for a while. But then I noticed that when he was playing Train Time, also in E, on an A harp, the chords that he was playing, I couldn't get on a C harmonica. I thought, why do the chords sound weird? And thus began the cognitive dissonance that has led me forward through life, trying to figure out this strange instrument and uh, all the, the delightful and odd things that it does. That's uh, that's awesome. I mean, the, the, the idea of the electric kazoo, uh, I mean, I'm a little bit sad that you picked up harmonica um, when you... you you had such a an imaginative uh, first instrument, but I, I'm also very glad that you did because you've you've gone uh, very far with it. Um, Thanks. But you you, uh, you also um, got quite into chromatic quite early on as well, didn't you? 
I did. When my mother saw that I was interested in harmonica, she thought, oh, let's get you a chromatic. I, I, she'd probably heard, you know, that's the, that's the real instrument. I mean, she didn't look down her nose at the, at the diatonic. So we went to the music store, and at first they didn't have a proper solo tune chromatic in stock. They had the Koch 980, which is the one that's tuned like a diatonic and is valveless. So I got that. And then later I decided, okay, let me, I could see why that was limited. And um, although it was, that was interesting to play as well. So I got a 64. Now back then, um, a, a, a Marine band, and this is Canadian money, which is worth slightly less, than, well, it depends on circumstances, but generally a bit less than U.S. money. A Marine band was $3.25. That 10-hole <laughs> chromatic was like $10. The 12 hole, which, you know, the, the Honer 270 was the only thing available then. That was $15 and a 64. The big 16 holer was $20. Wow. I mean, even given the difference in the value of money between then and now, that was still a pretty good deal. But German cu currency was still fairly depressed in the post-war period, even though the war had been over for 20 some odd years at that point. Uh, a few years later, the Deutschmark started its meteoric rise and of course, now it's the euro, and you know prices are rather different from what they were when I started. Yeah, it's it's not. I mean, I, I still think that harmonica is is a very uh, democratic instrument in terms of pricing, but it's uh, it's not quite quite that democratic anymore. Um, that's that's amazing. It, it sounds like your uh, your mum was really enthusiastic about fostering uh, musicality in you. Uh, was was she musical? She was. She played the piano and sang. Um, uh, I guess she'd had some classical training, but she made a point of, uh, well, she would, she would tell a story about how her father would like to show his daughters off as, you know, musicians to, to guests. And now he was, he was a clergyman. He was a, a Anglican priest. And so everything was, you know, proper. Uh, and she would get up and play some jaunty little pop tune just to kind of annoy him. <laughs> but sometimes the guests enjoyed that rather than a staid recitation of, you know, the, the golden classic stuff that everybody thought should be the approved way of expressing oneself musically. So she had a little bit of a rebellious streak um, in her that way. But yes, the family's quite musical. Uh, that, that definitely helps. Um, so you're learning diatonic and chromatic uh, simultaneously. And Right now, personally, I find that completely amazing just because I've only picked up chromatic in the last month. Um, ah. And it's it's uh, it's kind of working for me, but it's also hurting my brain a little bit just because there's a lot of muscle memory and uh, and ways of playing that, that I can't immediately translate to, to chromatic. Um, how, how, how was it learning both simultaneously? What were the kind of advantages of that? Well, one thing that I notice is that I don't seem to have a problem with different sizes of harmonica, different spacing and sizes of holes, different interfaces between the mouth and the harmonica, because I've played so many different kinds. Now, sometimes I see people, especially beginners, say, oh, this model uh, does this and this model does that. And to me, they're tiny differences. Mm -hmm. And I think that as a player progresses, the similarities between different harmonicas come to the fore and all those little differences kind of recede into the background. But at first they seem enormous to a lot of people when they start to play. Um, I didn't experience that. You know, between the, 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 the 10 hole quasi chromatic, the 16 hole huge chromatic and the standard size diatonic. And I remember I actually had a five hole little lady. Cool. Now it's, it's usually a four hole instrument. But for some reason, I walked into a music store and they had a five-hole one, a Honer. And you know, Honer made a lot of different harmonicas that vanished over time. And I remember there was a lot of new old stock in music stores when I started to play. Um, <clears throat> I remember going into a store and they had a, a Larry Adler chromatic in the silver box. Oh. It was a 16-hole uh, chromatic. And the sales guy actually tried to dissuade me from buying it. He said, no, it's the same harp as a regular 64, and it costs more money. Why buy that? Just, you know, buy the cheaper one. And I said, no, I want this one. I liked it. Uh, it was actually one of the best chromatics I've ever played. I, unfortunately, I lost it a few months later. I, I, I left it in a taxi cab, I think. 
and it was gone. And I suspect, I don't remember the details at this distance in time, that what I might have gotten was an old straight-tuned wood-bodied harmonica. Hmm. You know, there was just a lot of new old stock still floating around in music stores. Um, but learning chromatic and diatonic at the same time, I really did focus more on diatonic initially. And I would play chromatic to imitate what little Walter was doing when he played third position chromatic. And it wasn't until I got a 12 hole chromatic that I really started playing it as a melody instrument. Because something about that smaller format uh, just seemed to invite focusing on single note playing rather than those big chord washes with you know all the tongue blocked effects the third position blues chromatic really encourages. And that, was, that wasn't that was until a few years later. And I started to sort of more open up. Also, hearing players like, uh, certainly Toots Thielman was an eye-opener. Eye um, and Larry Adler. I remember hearing him as a teenager and being astounded that he could change so completely, phrase by phrase, the tone color of the instrument. You know, now it would sound like a flute, now like a violin, now like something else. Um <clears throat> So I had good models for mm. chromatic in my ear. Also, although I didn't know it at the time, Tommy Riley. Um, Tommy Riley, as you may know, is a Canadian who settled in the UK after the war and uh, had a career as a classical harmonica virtuoso. You know, made many recordings of, of the, the classical harmonica repertoire. A lot of it was St. Martin in the Fields. Uh, but he also was the harmonica on the uh, theme music to a children's program in Canada called Chez Hélène, where this woman, Hélène Bayarchand, who I later learned was actually a very respected folklorist and singer, uh, would be this sort of uh, mid-40s housewife who spoke only French, the neighbor girl who would drop by who spoke only English, and a puppet mouse, and I don't remember what language the mouse spoke, but it was, it was, an, <laughs> it was an effort to encourage bilingualism in Canadian children. Um, and theme music was this harmonica theme that I took to be French-Canadian music, uh, many years later, I was able to finally locate it, and it was actually a production company that Tommy Riley and another fellow owned that would produce library music, you know, pre-recorded music that could then be adapted for whatever commercial purpose. And he, he used a pseudonym for this as well, maybe in order not to sully his image as a serious classical musician. Uh, and you can actually find it on, uh, on iTunes now. But when I finally heard it again, I immediately recognized that it was him. And with his amazingly good tone and command of blending throat and hand vibrato, you know, all of the wonderful things about his playing. And I realized I had a very good model very early. Hmm. Not that I can play like him, but, you know, having good models, I think, is really essential to one's development as a player. You know, hearing little Walter and the Sonny Boys and all of those great blues players for uh, diatonic models, I think, is, is very, very important. And often younger people, I've noticed with my students, will come to harmonica from hearing like a current rock or blues rock band with a player who's good, but not like those really great, great players. Hmm. So, I mean, it, it's good. Well, just like I got in, into it from hearing Jack Bruce and um, Steve Winwood. You know, if I listen to their playing now, I think, yeah, OK. Um, but at the time, that really drew me in. And that's great that that happens. But then once that does happen hearing the really, really great players gets the possibilities and the depth of the instrument into your ear. No doubt. Um, and I, I think that I, I probably fall into that that category of, of people who, I, I didn't even pick up harmonica because I, I wanted to sound like any particular harmonica player. I, I literally just had to take a break from guitar due to injury and wanted an instrument that I could play. So I just wanted to play guitar lines on a harmonica and then, you know, weirdly got into this career that I've gotten into and then discovered the greats. And I was like, wow, there's, there are so many great sounds that I had no idea existed. Um, so I, I've had the kind of reverse discovery of, of the greats that uh, it, it took me far too long to get to. I only recently started listening to William Clark, which uh, I think a lot of people uh, will think is sacrilege that it took me so long. <laughs> well, I mean, you find what you find when you find it. Yeah. You know, there's there's there's, a, there's no shame in that. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to, to discover great players. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Uh, so I, I, I'm I'm very curious uh, because I'm I'm working on chromatic at the moment. I'm curious as to to how you 
uh, visualize diatonic and chromatic and and wh whether there's a difference between the two um so for example the thing that i'm th i'm thinking about at the moment is diatonic i i very much visualize in terms of intervals um i don't think about actual notes i think about the intervals that i'm playing whereas chromatic i'm i'm coming at it more from an idea of of it being almost like a piano and so i'm i'm trying to make a concerted effort to visualize actual letters rather than intervals um how does that um kind of compare to how you visualize i combine the two approaches i mean i think intervallically i think in terms of relationships it's sort of like you've got a formula and if you know the value of x the formula will populate all the other values you know if x happens to be c and this formula is a c major scale boom all the notes just kind of fall into into place Mind you, I've memorized all of the scales. I did that as a teenager, sort of like learning your multiplication tables mm -hmm. at school. You know, once you know it, you know it, and you don't have to think about it all that much. I, I'm lucky that way. I have that kind of mind, and I know not everyone does. And, you know, you have to use different approaches with different people. Um, but in the case of the chromatic, I still think intervallically. Now, I do play different keys of chromatic sometimes. You know, C is my default instrument, mm -hmm. but I have, I have other keys that I use. And... Um, it helps to be able to think intervallically because that way you're not all of a sudden stumped by the fact that in this particular place you've got a D instead of a C or whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit of a combination. Um, I suppose by default I think of it as a C instrument. And for instance, uh, one sometimes will hear voiced or read voiced, or read written, I suppose, uh, on some chromatic forms that... Uh, why should we have tab for, for, for chromatic? Or even, why should we talk about positions? You're playing mm. in C, you're playing in F, or whatever. You know. Uh, well, if you're playing different keys of chromatic, um, then it does help to think about positions. Um, tab, of course, is, is, is useful, although I've really tried to move a lot of my chromatic students away from it and towards notation. You know, tab will slow you down if you, if you really want to start reading music because you tend to look below to the arrows and numbers instead of to the staff. Uh, and, and I find I do the opposite. I look at the staff. I don't mm -hmm. want to look at tap personally, but it's very useful in teaching. Um, so, yeah, I combine the intervallic approach and the, um, uh, the um, uh, fixed pitch approach, shall mm -hmm. we say. It's sort of like there are two ways of teaching um, ear training and sight singing in music academies. There's fixed dough and movable dough. And movable dough is dough is whatever the whatever the tonic note is. You know, if you're in the key of C, C is dough. Mm -hmm. If you're in the key of F, F is dough. Whereas in the fixed dough system, dough is always C. Like in French, they don't you they don't call it the note C D E F. They're do re mi fa, and that mm -hmm. dough actually is C. And if you're in the key of F, well, fa is your home. You know, so it's it, two different approaches there, and that's kind of a parallel to what we see with what you're talking about in diatonic versus chromatic. Because you have different keys of diatonic, it's very useful to think intervallically in a sort of a movable dough system. With chromatic, again, there are different keys of chromatic, but it is um, probably helpful. If you, It certainly is if you're using just a C chromatic to think of actual note names. Now, the way to bridge them might be to say, okay, I know this interval structure for the key of C. So let me just map that onto the chromatic. Mm -hmm. right? And if you know that interval system and then you know the note names that occur when you apply that interval system to this key, right? then you're in the place you need to be in. And then you just need to fill in the little bits in between where the black keys are. Yeah. The other thing, though, about that, let me talk about the black keys. A thing that I often encounter with people, and sometimes with very experienced chromatic players, is they think of the slide-in notes as sharp. Mm -hmm. And they have trouble thinking about flats. Now, if you look at a piano keyboard, that black key between C and D isn't... It's, it's neither one nor the other. It's both, right? It's both mm -hmm. C sharp and it's D flat at the same time. It's just a matter of how do you want to spell that note according to whatever other circumstances might uh, make you do one or the other. I've always approached the slide in notes the same way. Sure, if you if if you press the slide in 
the note goes up a semitone. So it's easy to think of it as a sharp. That's a physical thing. Mm -hmm. Musical logic is not necessarily physical. All right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's logical. In the key of D, you're not going to have a D flat. The note named D is already in use. You're going you're gonna to have a, a D and a C sharp. Whereas in the key of A flat, you're going to have a D flat because you're going to use all flats mm -hmm. to, to define the scale. So I try and think of those. Oh, I don't have to try, me personally. Um, those notes are both. You know, that slide in note when you, when, you, when you play the blow note in hole five on a chromatic, that's the note that's between C and D. Mm -hmm. It's not automatically C sharp. It's not automatically D flat. That'll be determined by whatever else is going on in the music. Yeah, that, that's a really useful way to think about it because I, I have been struggling with that when I've been wanting to throw in all of my blues notes. And they're, they're all, in my mind, they're all flat notes from, you know, the, the note that I'm I'm hitting. I want to flatten it. And so that slide, to me, should be <laughs> flattening the note, and it's not. Um, right. Well, I mean, you can you can flip the slide over and have a flat slide chromatic, and some people do that so that the note goes down instead of up. Ah, Oh, wow. <laughs> You've just thrown throw me down a, a, an interesting uh, path. I, I feel like I, I should commit to, to learning on a standard chromatic harmonica and, and get around it. But that does sound like a, a really nice cheat. Yeah. The thing that happens then, though, is that your default slide out key on a C chromatic is now going to be D flat, let's say, or we can mm -hmm. call it C sharp. Um, and then you have to think, okay, do I need to get a different key of chromatic so that my slide out key is C, for instance? Uh, you know, and that's a whole, it, that's its, its own rabbit hole, so to speak. Mm. Um, but I mean, yeah, let's say if you're playing uh, in, um, I'll pick up a chromatic here. So that's sort of like a D minor arpeggio. So if I want to play the flat five, there's A, it's a draw note with a slide out. So I had to press in the slide and play a blow note. It's not the same thing as, uh, where's, my, where's a D harp? Rather, a G harp. You're not going to get that sound. Mm -hmm. Because, you're, well, you, you can bend the note down, but it doesn't sound as cool. All right? Um, you, you don't get the two reeds interacting the way you do on the, on the diatonic. So it's less of a lively, complex sound, but it's certainly possible. There are a lot of myths about what you can and can't do on the chromatic. And bending is one of them where people seem to think, oh, you'll damage the chromatic or it doesn't bend very far. Uh, neither of which is true. With good bending technique, you do no harm to the reed. And my favorite example of bending on chromatic actually being more flexible is... So that's like the opening to Cherry Pink and Apple Blossom White. And I was playing it in C, and when I got to the, ah, that G note, I bent it all the way down to an E. Mm -hmm. And it's a blow note. And if you listen to the original uh, Perez Prado uh, recording of it, the trumpet player does the same thing. In fact, he seems to bend it down a lot farther. And Jerry Murad and the harmonicats would sometimes do that same bend. And this is a stock chromatic. Now, individual instruments do vary a lot in their bendability, uh, but that kind of dispels the myth that you can't bend on a chromatic or you can't bend as far or it should only be a semitone or whatever. It's actually far more flexible as a bending instrument. It just doesn't sound as cool. Mm. People will sometimes take half the valves, the windsaver valves, off the chromatic so they can get that more diatonic sounding bend. But in so doing, they also severely limit the bending range. It's a trade-off. Mm. Interesting. You know, you can have you can have flexibility in range, or you can limit the the flexibility in range to get a cooler sounding bend. Hmm. Okay, so this 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 kind of brings the question to my mind: like, what what dictates your choice of what you pick up when when you're playing? Uh, sometimes I'll go back and forth, and okay. I might choose a different instrument on a different uh, date. Or even in the same song, I might change instruments, which is, has a long uh, uh, tradition, certainly. Little Walter did it on some of his records. 
Uh, you hear it from um, from other players as well. George Smith was was great that way. He would often trade back and forth, and he would play chromatics in different keys, 12-hole chromatics. Uh, you hear it on some country records, and I, I'll do it from time to time live as well. Um, or I might play it on one instrument one day and the other instrument the next. It's really a matter of what you feel will express best what the song is saying. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've played in a few um, musical productions, you know, th musical theater productions that have harmonica parts like Big River. And it'll call for this instrument or that instrument. And sometimes I say, no, I think it's better on this other one. You know, this will be better expressed on that instrument. And the composer's not here to <laughs> look over my shoulder and, uh, and the conductor won't know the difference. So uh, I'm going to go with it. Yeah, no, I, I think something that, that has, has kind of struck me and, it, and it, it did take a chromatic player saying this to me, but the ch chromatic harmonica is, is not a different instrument to, to diatonic. It's, it's another part of the harmonica player's arsenal. Um, and I, I've been, I've been hiding behind this idea that, you know, oh, well, you know, I don't play chromatic because it's a different instrument. And that's just an excuse not to put the time in to, to learning the, uh, you know, the different intervals and kind of locations of things. Um, but I am coming around to this idea that it's another part of the harmonica player's arsenal. And if you don't have it, you're, you're missing out on so many different extra sounds. That's a good way to look at it. I mean, it is also useful to think of it as a different instrument in the same family so that you don't get discouraged by thinking, oh, my gosh, if I can play a diatonic, why is it, isn't the chromatic just an easy thing to pick up? You know, it, it is different. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are so many similarities, you know, that I think it actually helps to build a bridge from one to the other. I mean, the bass harmonica, that's a very different animal. You know, it's all blow notes, very low pitched. It has a very different response to breath. And I, I play a little bit of bass as well and a little bit of chord. Uh, and they're all kind of fun to play with, but they, they have their own sets of requirements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel that, that you're one of the, the rare players who um, kind of does, does everything, um, you know, tech, technique wise. I, I, I might be wrong, but I feel like you, we were chatting about this a little bit before, but uh, you, you, you tongue block and you lip purse and I, I think you overblow as well, don't you? And mm -hmm. you kind of, you, you, you do it all where a lot of players kind of define themselves as, as one or other or a tradition, traditionalist or a modern player. Um, is that something that you try and foster in your students as well? Um, I try and see where they want to go and use that as a motivator because people vary a lot. You know, some people will have absolutely no interest in this or that or whatever. Uh, one of the things I had to recognize early on, and I noticed this at spa conventions, is that not everybody wants to be a blues diatonic player. And that very much informed the decisions I made about the initial uh, version of harmonica for dummies. I thought this really needs to address a broad base a fundamental technique that's going to serve you no matter what you want to play. Yeah, I think I think that's that's something that I struggle with because I, I I just teach blues and and kind of associated genres, um, and I'm I'm always surprised when I, I come across students who come in and say, "Well, where's all the other stuff?" And I'm like, well, for for me, that's that's all. It, not all harmonica is for me. It's it's all music is. I I've, I'm very focused on those genres on all instruments that I play. Um, so it it's it's quite eye opening to realize that actually there's a huge chunk of the population that have no interest in blues whatsoever. Right, but by the same token, so many people come to it from hearing either blues or blues influenced music. You know, often it's rock music that's clearly blues based. Um. And so, you know, one recognizes that, but always there's the possibility that that's not at all where they're coming from. Mm. No, it's uh, it's true. Uh, well, that's actually something I wanted to, to ask you about, because um, I know that you teach uh, at the jazz school in uh, in Berkeley, uh, California, um, and I, I'm assuming that you, that that means that you're teaching kind of more harmonically complex music. Uh, on harmonica than you know than a lot of the people listening probably play um 
do you find that there's been a kind of increase in people looking to play something that's maybe a little bit more virtuosic? Well, it depends on what you mean by virtuosic. I mean, you can be virtuosic with very simple uh, chord changes. Mm -hmm. And actually, when I was teaching at the jazz school, um, I was, re what, I mean, we tried different things, but we found that the only thing that consistently drew students was the beginning harmonica class. So again, I would work with the fundamentals of technique, which are the same for any style. Um, and it would have been nice to be able to follow that with, you know, increasing levels of complexity and virtuosity. But generally, we got people started mm -hmm. in those courses, despite the, the surrounding of, you know, being in the middle of all of that wonderful jazz activity. <laughs> I think yeah, by by virtuosic, I'm I'm probably thinking more kind of musically complex. So uh, for me, the, the idea of playing over changes and playing over more complex changes than a one four five is, is something that feels quite alien on on a diatonic harmonica. Certainly f for me, you know, if if I was playing more complex music, I would grab my guitar because it's chromatic easily and I can, I can visualize more, but I, I feel that I'm, and if I'm, I might, I might be wrong, but I feel that I'm seeing more advanced players now playing more advanced kind of harmonically advanced music. Definitely. There's an increase in uh, fluency and being able to get around on, on the diatonic harmonica. I mean, Jason Ritchie recently made the crack that, uh, uh, there's any number of Russian teenagers on YouTube who can play everything that he plays, uh, uh, which on a technical level might be true. I, so I think that statement's a wee bit hyperbolic, but um, I, I certainly understand where he's going. Uh, in terms of harmonic complexity, I'm not sure, though. Um, I mean, we're seeing people playing over rock changes, which, again, aren't that much more complex than blues changes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you might have a, a chord here and there that's thrown in from a related key, but mostly it's it's uh, chords drawn from that basic scale. Um, even with more harmonically complex music, though, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to find notes that don't want to come out of your harmonica. Right. In other words, you can find the notes that work mm -hmm. and then branch out from there. You know, it's, 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 it's sort of like crossing a river that has some stones you can jump from one to the other. Um, and then you get maybe get a bit more adventurous and maybe realize you can jump in the water occasionally. I think that, that that's you, you've given me a bit of a breakthrough just just uh, kind of psychologically about visualizing um, playing over more complex changes. Because, yeah, I think I've always felt that, you know, if, if I can play, you know, all the notes of, a, of an arpeggio or or of a, of a whole scale that would fit over a chord. I'd want to be able to do that over every chord in the sequence, but actually, yeah, having a, a stepping stone uh, of, a, of a couple of notes that might be more readily available on the diatonic would, it, it would probably be seamless to a listener. Right. Well, okay. Let me pose a theoretical uh, situation. And I apologize to the listeners who may find what I'm about to say puzzling. <laughs> Let's say you have an A flat major seventh chord and you have a C harmonica in your hand. Mm -hmm. Now, the A flat scale has four flat notes in it, none of which are built into the C harmonica. But if I look at that chord, it's got an A flat, then it's got a C, then it's got an E flat and a G. Well, C and G are both notes in that chord that are on your C harmonica. Right. Mm -hmm. You can get that A flat by bending draw three all the way down or draw six. The E flat, not so easy. It's an overblow, except maybe in hole eight where you can bend it down, bend the blow note down. Um, so you've got some possibilities. So maybe you just hang for dear life onto those notes while the raging river of A flat goes by on your C <laughs> harmonica <laughs> until you decide, oh, gee, let me try this other note here. Uh, gee, that sounds weird. Maybe if I bend it, it might sound better. You know, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's sort of like you, you find your little bright spots and then you you work out from there. Hmm, definitely. And I actually, I mean, that 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 exact scenario, um, the notes that are readily available on the harmonica are, are the ones that are probably 
musically most interesting over that that chord anyway because you, right. you you don't have the the root and the fifth that are kind of you know the the most bland sounding note that you could play uh over that chord and i, I apologize to listeners if this has gotten super uh music geek um but but that's the, yeah that's an interesting way of thinking about it well, you you've got the color notes mm-hmm. in, instead of the the structural notes yeah exactly that's a, the perfect way to put it very cool. Uh, now, I, I know that you, you have a, a hard out um, uh, in about five minutes, so I, I don't want to uh, take too much more of your time, but, but this has been really, really fantastic. Um, I was just wondering if there's uh, anything that uh, you want me to uh, tell, well, anything you want to tell the, the audience about that you're working on, that you want to promote, any new projects? Well, uh, one of the things that I'm doing, I recently did a series of three talks on the social history of the harmonica, uh, all of which are available. I did them live on successive Friday nights. It's part of something called the Virtual Film Fest. Uh, They have a Facebook page. You can find all three episodes there. Uh, I'm looking at probably or possibly putting together a course uh, doing more of this social history of the harmonica, of which there's quite an amazing amount. so that's something to maybe look forward to. Um, check my Facebook pages for possible announcements. Uh, my website, winslowyorksa.com, although I tend to put a lot more stuff on Facebook just because it's easier to do. Uh, and, of course, we've got future things coming up at the Harmonica Collective and with the upcoming Spa Week in August. Very cool. So I'll put uh, links to all of that in the show notes below. Um, and so, so spa, I'm just going to very quickly end on spa. Um, is it, is it something that we can buy tickets to now? Is it ready to, uh, to speak about? <laughs> uh, well, go to the spah.org, spa.org. Uh-huh. Um, that's where the, the current announcements will be. You know, some people did buy their full convention ticket, uh, before we decided we needed to cancel the live event. And some of, some of those folks have donated, Others have um, um, put it towards next year's. We're doing a variety of things that way. Um, so just check check the the um, not the, well the Facebook page too has announcements. But the the best place to go really for the current information is spa.org. Brilliant. Well, hopefully I will uh, see you there in person uh, next year. But uh, I will uh, I will come and see the the live events uh, online uh, in August. And yeah, once again, thank you so much for for spending some time with me today. This has been really really interesting. And I'm probably going to ask you if I can pick your brains again about uh, all this uh, chromatic and jazzy and interesting harmonic content. Sure, we can do a follow up session if you like. That would be fantastic. Well, enjoy the okay. rest of your day. Thanks, Tomlin. And I better get on to my other student. (laughs) No worries. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your podcast player of choice. Join me next Monday for the next episode. Happy harping!